Nalin, suddenly we lost, no? Yeah, I have to end the meeting and then it worked. Ah, I see, I see. I don't know, there's some technical issue. Right. Now come on. Sir. How is it? No, no. No, no. I didn't have to close the meeting. There was some problem. Now, now I think they will come back. They will come back. They will come back. They were more than 15. 15. 15, 1, 5. Because one, five. everywhere there is a power cut. So we can't right expect a lot today, but what we can do is we can start recording. We can start recording. Of. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, then we can share it. Mm. No, yeah, yeah, that's that, 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 that. Because, that's uh, the... Because uh, today's can... situation is bad, very bad. We, we, can't, we can't think of a better day, no? <laughs> yes, yes. There yes. won't be better days. Yeah, there won't be better days soon. Better yes. days in near future. Yeah. So shall I start the presentation? Yeah, 15, 15 minutes already gone. Ne? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to make an uh, introduction. Uh, yes. Shall I do it? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, Ms. Avan, now, yes. In, yes. Today we, we are going to have the lecture number two on deep excavation with Patrices by Dr. Nalindi Silla. Uh, Dr. Nali Indesilla is serving as a senior lecturer attached to the Department of Civil Engineering, University of Moratua, since 2009. With over 18 years of experience as a geotechnical engineer, Dr. De Silla is largely involved in the analysis and design of deep excavation and foundation in Sri Lanka. This lecture will cover an introduction to the construction, selection of different deep excavation support system, different lateral support system, general guidelines on the analysis and design, planning and design of crowd water control systems, importance of monitoring during deep excavation and contingency plans to minimize the risk of unexpected failure. Further, best practices for quality assurance and safety during construction of deep excavation will also be discussed today. <clears throat> uh, this is a, a basic uh, introduction of the our resource person and as well as the party is going to present today. And now I want to make this, uh, another announcement at the beginning of the uh, Geo Forum. Our next Geo Forum will be uh, conducted by Dr. Professor Saman Tilakasiri on application of or, or rather introduction of Euro, Euro code that is called EC7 that is basically on geotechnical designs. He will uh, make an introduction in our Geo Forum uh, uh, schedule in, uh, uh, in the last week of uh, best day of last week in April. With that small note, I, I, I like to invite Dr. Nalinda Silla to make the presentation. I know it is a very great uh, difficulties with the power cuts and so on. We have to uh, uh, conduct this Geo Forum. But uh, I think we are going to record this uh, uh, lecture and uh, later also uh, uh, it can be used to our members. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, podium is for Dr. Nali. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sabandu, for your introduction. Uh, in the last uh, lecture, I have discussed uh, about the uh, general guidelines for geotechnical analysis and design and I gave an introduction to uh, the different systems available for deep excavation support. And uh, today I'm going to discuss in brief about uh, the, on how to control uh, groundwater 
uh, the methods available for monitoring and the importance of monitoring and uh, if the things are not happening as expected uh, what are the available contingency plans and finally about the quality assurance aspects will also be discussed so let me uh, quickly move uh, to Naling can you go to the full screen ah yeah sure 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 PowerPoint, uh, just, uh, okay right I'll, I'll go. Okay, I hope you all you. can see. Yeah, right. So I would like to discuss about the control of uh, groundwater uh, and uh, the methods available for the selection of groundwater are uh, presented uh, in this figure uh, depending on the permeability, uh, the equivalent permeability of the aquifer to be uh, dewatered, the different options available uh, for different dr expected drawdowns. Actually, this, uh, uh, this figure is readily applicable for open type excavations because uh, we don't expect a, a significant drawdown in supported uh, or cut -off, wall, mm -hmm. cut off wall systems. We just want to, uh, there can be a, some small seepage uh, plus the uh, water inside the excavation have to be dewatered but in open type excavation some drawdown is uh, required to keep the excavation dry so uh, depending on the re uh, required amount of drawdown in meters and the permeability we can think of different systems like such as deep wells well points sumps and so on so in uh, uh, supported uh, excavations the open sums are very widely used because we don't need to uh, achieve uh, a significant drawdown uh, we can we simply need to dewater uh, the water inside the excavation so uh, and there are different uh, the uh, the uh, objectives of uh, dewatering uh, say for example uh, they are listed here stopping the surface water from entering into the excavation is one objective uh, then uh, we have to keep the excavation dry uh, that is the main objective of dewatering so uh, and this figure again uh, gives uh, the applicable different uh, the ranges of applicability of different methods uh, uh, as a particle size distribution analysis in, in a particle size distribution analysis plot so uh, depending on uh, how it plots the particle size distribution uh, and uh, the uh, uh, the falls into the different envelopes we can think of selecting different methods for uh, appropriate methods for dewatering uh, <clears throat> so one of the main uh, design parameter is the coefficient of permeability clay uh, so typical values uh, in in the absence of uh, field uh, test uh, data most of the case we don't have field uh, permeability test done for deep excavations uh, so in such case some typical values are given here uh, porosity is uh, is important in uh, in the calculation of amount of the, the water to be dewatered inside the excavation because uh, below the below the water level uh, you have some volume of water to be excavated so uh, porosity is a very useful parameter say for example in uh, uh, in general a porosity of about 0.35 to 0.4 is used uh, in the dewatering analysis so that means uh, the, if you consider the total volume uh, below the groundwater table about 35 percent to 40 percent of uh, the total volume is water so that amount has to be dewatered from the excavation so the rate of uh, the dewatering and the size of the pumps also all, all the parameters can be calculated based on this calculation so in addition to this uh, the volume of water inside the excavation there will be some seepage uh, uh, from the surrounding 
uh, the uh, the dewatering analysis can be carried out uh, in two different uh, broadly uh, two different ways the uh, the pre defined designs using analytical methods graphical methods such as flow nets they are widely used then there are numerical methods uh, some typical examples are shown here uh, the numerical methods are actually uh, there are spreadsheet based finite difference uh, programs and finite element packages are also available for dewatering analysis whatever you do because uh, this uh, groundwater flow analysis is uh, very much dependent on the coefficient of permeability of the aquifer uh, equivalent coefficient of permeability so uh, no matter uh, how accurate or how uh, uh, advanced your analysis is it has to be coupled with the observational approach and the parameters have to be adjusted based on the observational uh, uh, records that I have to emphasize. So uh, some uh, I, would, I would like to quickly go through some uh, available uh, groundwater control systems. Some pumping is the most widely used uh, dewatering system uh, for deep excavation. Uh, it's very effective and economical. Uh, uh, and it can achieve a modest drawdown of about two two meters maximum. So actually, we don't need uh, if you are dewatering inside an excavation, we don't uh, need a drawdown. So this is the uh, uh, the most appropriate method in such case. Uh, uh, some typical uh, arrangements for uh, some pumping uh, shown here. So you can have uh, some uh, uh, like a barrel perforated barrel covered with uh, some filter media and inside you have the uh, the submersible pump and can take water out from the submersible pump. In uh, some cases uh, for large scale dewatering uh, concrete cylinders also can be used uh, as shown here typically shown here. Uh, then comes well points. Uh, well points we can achieve a drawdown of about 5-6 meters and well points are widely used in open type excavations or trench excavations. Uh, they are not widely used in uh, uh, the uh, <coughs> deep excavation supported by retaining walls. Uh, and again uh, the most appropriate uh, the envelope, particle size envelope for uh, well point systems is shown here. So this can be used as a guide in selecting uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, well point system. <coughs> so in the uh, and there are uh, very useful design monographs available. I uh, although they are, they are not very relevant for uh, <coughs> deep excavations. I would like to uh, show you some useful design monographs. Uh, and uh, for example, this one the left hand one it's applicable for uniform sands and gravels the right hand one is for layered uh, sands and gravels uh, so depending on the coarseness of the material you can see fine sand medium sand and uh, on the left hand side it's the um, required drawdown in the uh, in the dewatering analysis the amount of drawdown required so if you join this uh, Align with the, the type of soil, we can select the appropriate well point spacing, right? Uh, for fine sand, say for example, 2.5 meter spacing in this this particular case. So a similar analog analogy can be used for uh, the right hand uh, figure as well. So these uh, are very useful tools uh, in the design of well point systems. Uh, the yield of a well point uh, the, uh, the, uh, from a single uh, well point uh, having a length of 700 millimeters is given here. Uh, <coughs> so it's just for information. Uh, and then comes deep wells. So deep wells are widely used to dewater from outside the deep excavations. So if there are no uh, structures around, uh, so, uh, dewatering from outside can can be considered and deep wells can be used to achieve a significant amount of drawdowns uh, <coughs> and the, the depth of uh, more than 10 meters uh, drawdowns more than 10 meters can be achieved uh, through deep wells and the deep wells can the, the depth of the deep well can vary from 10 to 35 meters e even 
deeper ones are also available and a typical configuration of a deep well is shown here so you have a, a, a large diameter borehole and inside there is a, a perforated casing uh, and the annular spacing is uh, covered with a filter media the casing is usually covered with a geotextile and inside you have a uh, the submersible pump so some typical uh, configurations are given here Uh, some uh, typical uh, pump, so the discharge rates, uh, the uh, recommended minimum internal diameter of the casing and uh, the borehole diameters depending on the discharge rate are, are given here and you can use this uh, in uh, selecting the appropriate uh, the dimensions for the deep well. So I, I am not going to spend a lot of time on uh, this. And then uh, for the calculation of the, the yield from uh, a deep well, this uh, figure is quite useful depending on the permeability, X axis is the, the equivalent permeability of the uh, aquifer to be dewatered and you can see different curves for different uh, boreholes, the diameters and you can uh, get the, the yield. Okay, <coughs> in liters per second. So this is per a wetted a wetted length is uh, it's like the slotted area of the uh, the casing. So some uh, typical uh, the the, uh, the design considerations for uh, deep wells construction details are given here. Uh, it is recommended to have uh, the slot sizes. Uh, the slot size is uh, it's better to have the uh, approximately equal to uh, D10 of the filter media. Uh, then uh, about 20% of uh, the uh, casing has to be slotted. In general, usual uh, geotextile is usually placed over the well screen. And uh, when uh, the deep well starts to operate, some uh, ground subsidence can take place, and uh, the filter media also can. Uh, compact and some depression, ground depression can occur. So due to this, it is generally recommended to place uh, the filter media about 0.5 to 1 meter above the top of the slotted part of the deep well. <coughs> uh, otherwise, what happens is the fine material will enter the deep, uh, the through the casing, the slotted area into the well and uh, it might affect the efficiency. So uh, and it is also a good practice to have about a 300 millimeter filter pack at the base also. So uh, the deep wells are uh, susceptible to uh, something called encrustation that is due to the chemical precipitation or bacterial growth in the well screen the, the efficiency might, might be uh, affected in the long run if uh, the uh, the deep wells keep on operating for more than two three months uh, this can significantly affect the performance of the deep well so we have to take appropriate measures to clean uh, and uh, the re redevelop uh, the deep wells and recharge wells and this system is not uh, available in sri lanka as far as i know I have inquired uh, from different contractors but they said they don't have this. This is called an ejector. Uh, in the ejector, the high pressure water jet is circulated and uh, when it goes through this nozzle, it creates a vacuum and this vacuum sucks water uh, into the, the pipe, the drain pipe. So uh, this is uh, useful. Uh, very useful uh, in very low permeability soils such as uh, silty sands uh, or silts uh, for dewatering in such soils. Uh, so in addition to uh, the ejectors, there are some other methods available uh, like horizontal well pointing, pressure relief wells. Uh, pressure relief wells are like sand drains. I will show you some figures. 
then comes collector wells they are not used uh, very rarely used in uh, deep excavation systems then uh, the electroosmosis is also very rarely used in deep excavation it is more like a ground improvement method uh, than uh, a dewatering method but electroosmosis also can be used to dewater from uh, very fine soils like clay uh, type soils uh, so in some cases uh, dewatering systems the given dewatering systems are used in combination as well so pressure relief wells uh, as i told you are like uh, uh, sand drains or gravel drains uh, <coughs> then uh, i quickly go through this pressure relief wells uh, sorry this is a collector well it's a large diameter so this is actually uh, uh, not used as a dewatering system uh, it is uh, this kind of systems are uh, used uh, to create uh, like uh, water supply wells okay uh, this is uh, like a large diameter caisson and horizontal uh, horizontal wells right are installed around the caisson then uh, the electroosmosis uh, as i told you it's uh, not very rarely used as a, a dewatering method it's more like a ground improvement technique so there we have a, a cathode and an anode you can see a cross section taken through uh, the cathode and anode uh, they are metal strips uh copper is used and a power supply is given so uh the uh, <coughs> water particles are attracted to the cathode and it can be pumped out uh using uh, uh, a perforated pipe <coughs> so uh the effects of dewatering are uh, like uh, Uh, have to be carefully considered settlement resulting from uh, the instability of excavation so uh, then uh, there can be ground settlement due to loss of fines uh, due to uh, dewatering uh, and uh, the uh, ground settlement uh, again can be induced by uh, the increase in the effective stress due to dewatering the drawdown of the water table it causes the increase of the effective stress that can uh, create settlements uh, and uh, the uh, other less important uh, from uh, the geotechnical point of view i would say uh, the uh, effects uh, effects are depletion of groundwater sources uh, changes in the groundwater quality uh, environmental related uh, issues the set ground settlement induced by the increase in the effective stress can be calculated using uh, this uh, the equation using the coefficient of volume compressibility uh, <coughs> of the subsurface delta u is the effective stress increase or uh, the pore water pressure uh, change due to the drawdown of water table uh, h is the thickness of the compressible layer so this can be used to uh, approximate the, the the ground settlement induced by uh, uh, the the drawdown of the water table so if this uh, settlement is significant uh, we have to consider recharging of uh, the ground water table so some recharging uh, options are shown here there are a large number of recharging options for deep but for deep excavations recharging wells and recharging pits are widely used so i would uh, like to uh, only discuss about these uh, two methods uh so you can see uh on the left hand side uh, a trench is used for groundwater uh, recharging in on the left hand side uh, a well is used so these wells are more like uh, the observation wells uh <coughs> so uh, on the left hand side if this uh, the trench is not there the ground water table would be uh, due to this is where pumping is taking place the the, the ground water table would be something like this so this drawdown is uh, recovered up to some extent due to the presence of the recharge trench 
uh, this is uh, the uh, the recharge well uh, so again it is very very similar to uh, the uh, the observation well they have a well screen and this is the the the, the down pipe where you pump water into a uh, into the, the the discharge recharge well uh, sometimes this is done under pressure but uh, we have to be very careful when uh, recharging groundwater table uh, under pressure or injecting water because it might affect the stability of the uh, the excavation support system so it increases the pore water pressure uh, uh, behind the retaining wall and it can cause some distress uh, on the retaining wall so that we have to be very careful in that over recharging is not recommended at all okay. so uh, as a general uh, statement uh, it is much harder to recharge the water than dewater so uh, as a rule of thumb it is said that to recharge back water into the aquifer from uh, where it came uh, two or three recharge wells are needed for every abstraction well so one dewatering well the, the if you want to recharge the uh, the same amount of water into ground it is as a rule of thumb is to have two uh, recharge wells so it is you, you can see that how difficult it is to recharge the groundwater table so uh, some uh, application is shown here this is uh, uh, one project in Kolpiti and we have recommended this kind of uh, uh, recharge well near the important uh, structures because uh, the, the structures are the places where we have to be worried about the differential uh, settlement the additional settlement due to uh, the drawdown of water table so uh, it is recommended to recharge the groundwater table uh, close to important structures So uh, there are some issues uh, related to groundwater recharge uh, and uh, I'm not going to go into the detail mainly uh, the uh, aeration can cause gas binding so we have to prevent the aeration of water and again uh, if the, uh, the water contains contain sediments or ions it can significantly affect the uh, efficiency uh, of uh, the recharging operation so recharging recharge wells are uh, susceptible to uh, clogging uh, compared to the drawdown uh, sorry uh, dewatering wells so frequent cleaning of uh, the recharge wells is required so in some cases once a month uh, it's recommended to recharge uh, sorry clean the recharge wells uh, once a month using air lifting techniques better to remove the debris and the suspended uh, solids at the bottom of the recharge wells so uh, you can see in the in the right hand side there, there's a figure uh, this figure explains about uh, the uh, frequency of cleaning of uh, recharge wells uh, uh, not the only recharge wells, uh, uh, different dewatering systems, uh, well point submersible uh, ejector wells and so on, recharge wells are also there. When the iron concentration is high, you have to frequently clean. So that's the uh, general the recommendation. So uh, if the iron concentration is less, uh, so about uh, at, at one month or some, in some cases three months, uh, interval is enough uh, then I would like to uh, move on to uh, monitoring and uh, contingency plans so uh, I took I uh, extract this figure from uh, the NBRO guidelines for uh, uh, foundation and uh, the deep excavations it can be uh, freely downloaded from the NBRO website so according to this uh, you can see that this is the the yellow line demarcates the boundary of periphery of the excavation and it is recommended so uh, 
prior to the excavation we have to carry out uh, existing uh, condition survey of uh, the adjacent buildings so it is recommended in the nbro guidelines to survey uh, the uh, existing structures which are within 50 meters distance from the the boundary of the proposed excavation and uh, special consideration should, shall be given to archaeologically important sites Uh, different methods available for uh, monitoring. Monitor. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the uh, existing uh, the condition survey. Uh, I'm going to talk about the monitoring of the deep excavation. Okay. So uh, water level and the def deformation and the strut forces are the uh, and the ground heave are the parameters to be measured. So there are large number of monitoring uh, instruments available and you can see uh, the, the, the among those methods the methods uh, the enclosed in uh, the red color are the widely used methods in Sri Lanka uh, if I explain a uh, few of them like uh, settlement of ground surface uh, and the deformation of the wall surveying methods are widely used uh, then comes uh, Plumb lines are installed along the wall to measure the uh, in, any inclination of the wall and inclinometers are well, widely used in the deep excavations in Sri Lanka <coughs> then subsurface settlement points are sometimes used uh, piezometers and uh, the, uh, the probes are used for uh, uh, the water pressure measurement and uh, the water level of water level measurements in the in the observation wells <coughs> crack gauges are used to measure the 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 cracks of the existing structures and the structures surrounding the excavation uh, then in uh, in uh, in some cases some very deep excavation very important ones uh, differential strain gauges and load cells are installed to measure the prop forces So uh, one of the biggest advantage of uh, monitoring is that the monitoring records other than uh, the stability of the wall, monitoring records can be effectively used to validate and calibrate the, uh, the numerical models. So finite element analysis results. So that is a, a very important uh, aspect of uh, monitoring during uh, deep excavations. So some in instrumentation uh, are shown here. Uh, <coughs> I, I will uh, show you some uh, larger uh, uh, schematic diagrams in the coming figures. So basically we have extensometers, inclinometers, uh, the strain gauges, load cells uh, and so on. <coughs> so th this is uh, a, a typical ground settlement marker can see uh, on the left hand side uh, <coughs> it's a 16 millimeter bar uh, driven to a depth of about uh, 1 meter or more and with uh, covered with a concrete cap at the top so this can be used to measure the ground settlement and this is uh, on the right hand side a heave gauge a typical heave gauge is uh, shown that is used to measure the uh, the uh, the ground heave okay during uh, excavations uh, and this enlarged part is, is uh, installed below the excavation surface so this is uh, the excavation level final excavation level so below 150 meters you have to install this uh, the enlarged sec section okay <coughs> and uh, from the top you can take survey readings to measure the uh, the, the heave ground heave then comes uh, extensometer there are large varieties of uh, extensometer lot of patented uh, the products are also available uh, in the sim simplest type of uh, extensometer which is known as the fixed borehole type uh, extensometers we measure the extension of a, a wire fixed to the bottom of the the borehole so that this gives if there is a movement uh, uh, in the along the borehole uh, 
so the wire will be extended and that extension is monitored and uh, these are some uh, modern type of extensometers known as magnetic extensometers so uh, these are installed uh, along the borehole you can install them at different depths uh, and a sensor which is uh, sensitive to uh, the uh, the the magnets uh, uh, of the magnetic extensometers this is the probe it is lowered so when uh, it detects the magnet we can uh, uh, identify the location of the uh, the uh, this uh, the spider magnet it's called spider magnet you can see uh, so uh, and uh, by monitoring the location we can get an idea about the movement of the the ground right <clears throat> then uh, some uh, photos of the, the installation of load cells to measure the prop forces and uh, strain gauges are shown here uh, you can see uh, some uh, uh, vibrating wire type strain gauges are fixed to uh, the the steel i section and in this case uh, the load cells are placed at the joint between two i sections to directly measure the prop force the strain gauges measure the strain and by using the hook flow the strain can be converted to the stress the monitoring frequency is a uh, uh, there are general guidelines but the frequency of reading should be related to the construction activity uh, if the construction uh, works are going very slowly uh, I mean you don't have to take very frequent monitoring readings so and uh, it it has to be related to the rate at which the readings are changing so if the readings are changing frequently we have to take more readings to capture the uh, the, the behavior too many readings in, in general too many readings overload the, the processing and interpretation capacity whereas too few may cause important events to be missed and uh, prevent timely actions from being taken so uh, this is something very important so it, it is uh, generally required to carry out few sets of initial readings to establish a reliable uh, uh, frequency uh, then uh, yeah, it is always recommended to take readings after some uh, some disturbance like uh, a blast or a heavy rain or an earthquake so after some disturbance to the construction activity it is always recommended to take uh, monitoring readings immediately after the event So as the construction mo uh, activity moves away from the uh, instrument location or uh, if the uh, monitoring records ceases, seems to cease, uh, we can think of uh, the, uh, the uh, increasing the monitoring frequency or, or uh, the, uh, sorry reducing the monitoring frequency. You can take readings uh, uh, with a longer interval. So some general guidelines. Uh, for uh, the selecting the monitoring frequency are shown here uh, a benchmark where you uh, take uh, to, uh, to compare with your readings it is recommended to uh, change the location uh, check the location of the benchmark coordinates of the benchmark for every three months during uh, a deep excavation then all the other uh, the uh, monitoring records like settlements uh, in kilometer readings uh, the observation well readings so, and so on are recommended to take once a week in general right in general uh, as i told you if some uh, significant disturbance took place uh, like a heavy rain or earthquake better to take readings immediately after the event uh, <clears throat> so in general uh, the uh, instrumentations uh, inclinometers so for example should be installed at the location where the maximum wall deflection is expected right and uh, the observation wells observation wells uh, can be used for recharging as well so we have to install them close to existing structures because uh, 
the uh, effect of dewatering can be very significant on uh, the existing structures. So, as a general recommendation, install the, uh, the inclinometers at the places where maximum deflection is expected. The uh, uh, the uh, observation wells better to install close to existing structures. Uh, the inclinometers can be installed either through the the wall or outside the wall <coughs> and it should be fixed to uh, it's recommended to fix to uh, some uh, uh, the fixed point like uh, the rock or a very hard strata uh, if hard strata is not av uh, uh, the uh, uh, available up to a significant depth you have to go up to a depth where no lateral deformation is expected and from there you have to uh, <coughs> stop the terminate the the, uh, the inclinometer uh, <coughs> if the inclinometers uh, are installed outside the uh, existing wall it is generally recommended to uh, maintain a distance less than 2 meters you are measuring uh, the wall deformation far away from the wall is uh, I mean it does not have a lot of uh, uh, use <coughs> So uh, this is, uh, you can see uh, a typical uh, inclinometer casing and the inclinometer and uh, the working principle is very simple. It measures the inclination of, of this rod and uh, inclination of this rod and the length of the rod is fixed. If you know the inclination and the length, you can measure the, uh, the lateral deformation using uh, simple trigonometry. So that's the working principle and this is how uh, the inclinometer casing is installed through a, a diaphragm wall for example and when we insert the inclinometer in this direction you can get the uh, the variation in the major movement uh, the, the variation of the deformation in the major direction and by in, in inserting the inclinometer in the other direction perpendicular direction uh, we can get the movement uh, in, in the uh, <coughs> longitudinal direction so you can see some two typical records uh, in, in this direction we don't expect a lot of deformation because it's quite stiff in this direction the wall and uh, isolated regular monetary records are of not much use so i i, I have seen in many uh, deep uh, excavation projects they take monetary records just for uh, for the sake of taking uh, the uh, the monitoring records and uh, isolated individual uh, readings are available actually it's very difficult to interpret so you have to plot the variation with time right and the trend has to be carefully monitored the person who takes this reading have to be trained on identifying these trends and uh, the uh, immediately communicated to uh, the relevant people for taking actions so say for example you can see uh, this is a typical uh, lateral deformation survey measurement uh, taken uh, i mean plotted against the time and you can see in one uh, location some abnormal behavior is uh, is recorded so we have to carefully observe this uh, where this happens takes place and see what is wrong here and we have to take the appropriate uh, remedial measures this is again uh, uh, the uh, settlement settlement and uh, with time so you can see some trend increasing trend this has to be carefully observed and this is uh, the uh, groundwater level variation with time there can be seasonal variation also so uh, it's better to have some uh, reference reading somewhere outside the excavation and compare uh, the uh, the readings in your observation wells with the reference so then we can clearly uh, uh, identify the seasonal variations and uh, the water table variations due to drawdown uh, then I would like to discuss about the maximum allowable wall deflection limits uh, and I took this uh, these two figures from uh, the uh, Singapore guidelines building and construction authority Singapore 
uh, <coughs> you can see that according to this guideline uh, the uh, the the retained site okay is divided into three zones depending on the distance from the uh, edge of the wall the x okay x over h less than 1 that means uh, the uh, this distance x is uh, uh, less than or equal to the excavation depth right oh uh, and this zone 1 to 2 x over h ratio equals to 1 to 2 zone 2 and zone 3 so depend if you have structures in within zone 1 structures to be protected important structures to be protected in zone 1 the maximum allowable deflection limit is 0.5 percent according to this guideline then if you have structures within point uh, sorry zone 2 you don't have any structures in zone 1 but there are structures uh, to be protected in zone 2 area the the the, uh, the guideline is bit relaxed 0.7 percent uh, you can go up to 0.7 percent of the uh, the excavation depth h okay as the maximum allowable wall deflection uh, then uh, <coughs> in zone 3 uh, some values are given depending on different ground types the ground type a is uh, some good soils including residual soils ground type b is soft soils okay then uh, the uh, action limits uh, the control strategies so for zone 1 uh, the alert level is uh, recommended as 70 percent of wsl is this uh, the uh, 0.5 percent the allowable wall deflection limit or it's known as work suspension level as well again it's also called action level so you have to take action stop immediately stop the excavation further excavation and take appropriate uh, the actions to uh, prevent further uh, the deformation so 70 percent of the action level is taken as the alert level right and in zone 2 and 3 again some uh, the alert levels check level alert level and the work suspension levels are defined according to this uh, then uh, I would like to quickly go through uh, the allowable uh, the uh, settlements building settlements uh, the uh, depending on the the amount of settlement we can uh, categorize them as negligible or severe and the the expected damage structural damage so uh, some guidelines are given uh, then about the angular distortion of structures uh, and one 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 is to 500 is the safe limit for buildings where cracking is not permissible uh, <coughs> if the angular distortion is more than that some cracks may appear on existing structures and this is again a, a, a diagram similar diagram yeah, in the x axis the lateral uh, the strain deformation is converted into a strain that is the strain means the whatever the deflection divided by whole deflection divided by the uh, the excavation depth and then this x axis is the angular distortion if you plot the angular distortion versus lateral uh, strain we can get an idea about the expected damage structural damage uh, then uh, so I, I am not going to go uh, explain this because uh, this is about the allowable settlement of uh, the RC structures individual footings mat footings and so on uh, so uh, I'm not going to explain it in detail uh, then I would like to discuss about the contingency plans uh, <coughs> what should we do if uh, the things are not happening as expected so according to the uh, NBR requirements uh, any contractor planning to carry out a deep excavation has to submit uh, the uh, the contingency plans in, in their uh, the report so these uh, aspects have to be considered uh, excessive lateral movement of the wall and ground settlement right if uh, the, the the lateral movement and the settlement is about to exceed the action level what can we do so uh, we have to increase the number of lateral supports to reduce the unsupported length of the wall in general you have to increase the stiffness of the lateral support system 
and then uh, leaking uh, through the wall and this can be extremely dangerous leaking through the wall particularly in situations where the subsurface is sandy and the water table is high because uh, you will see that particles will be lost in no time and large ground depressions can occur on the retained side due to this so immediate uh, actions have to be taken in the contingency plan we have to immediately stop the, uh, the further excavation try to block the leak using uh, the sandbags straw textile fabric okay and try to manage or reduce the flow the once the leak is stabilized and uh, you somehow you have to stop the particle the fine uh, coming out from the the hole once that is done uh, create uh, you <coughs> you may create uh, some uh, uh, berm using sandbags uh, then inject grout columns behind the leaking uh, section and uh, co constructing a concrete skin wall also can be considered uh, if uh, leaks are quite small uh, those leaks can be uh, addressed from out, uh, the outside that means from the excavation site right grouting can be carried out from the excavation site but some uh, serious ones we have to uh, do the grouting from the the, the behind uh, <clears throat> then uh, failure of dewatering system or insufficient drawdown mm -hmm. you have to have uh, standby additional pumps and uh, the number of wells have to be increased uh, the uh, piping uh, if piping or uh, excessive ground heave is uh, observed you have to stop dewatering and uh, the uh, refill the excavation with water up to the level that adequately stabilizes the situation <clears throat> then once the situation is stabilized we have to take permanent solutions like grouting creating a grout plug at the the bottom of the uh, excavation so these are very costly uh, expensive uh, remedial measures uh, if excessive deformation is uh, observed in adjacent properties structural damage we have to we have no cho option choice we have to rectify the damages sometimes underpinning may be required uh, and if excessive seepage and groundwater lowering uh, we have to have plan for <coughs> groundwater recharge okay so in general if the drawdown is uh, it seems to exceed 2 meters better to think of recharging the uh, the groundwater table near existing structures <clears throat> so this is uh, some uh, schematic uh, diagram on uh, how to address a leak through the wall <coughs> so I, I have already explained this so I am not going to spend time and there can be uh, issues in pulling out the sheet piles in some cases uh, it creates a hole which is difficult to be grouted and uh, if there are important structures on the retained side structures to be protected we, we have to think of keeping them in place right permanently sheet piles near the existing structures otherwise uh, the pulling out of uh, long sheet piles can create a lot of uh, ground subsidence and then uh, there are some very expensive uh, the uh, auxiliary methods for controlling wall and ground deformations ground improvement uh, in the deep excavation so uh, uh, the creating a very stiff block type region or a column type regions in the uh, below the excavation level or uh, the, the wall type uh, uh, the uh, stiffening okay ground improvement also can be considered but these are very expensive and uh, how to uh, do proper design for this kind of uh, auxiliary methods and uh, some uh, other techniques auxiliary methods are also explained here uh, creating counterfort walls right <clears throat> the below the excavation level we can think of creating counterfort walls to uh, reduce the wall def deformation then uh, cross walls 
right this is like a kind of soil struct right uh, reinforced uh, it can be reinforced or unreinforced cement mixed uh, or jet grouted uh, cross walls can be uh, constructed below the bottom of the excavations to uh, stiffen and reduce the wall deflection underpinning uh, has to be done in extreme case if uh, there are uh, important structures and uh, if some uh, excessive settlement is observed we have to transfer the loads of the existing uh, the found building foundations to uh, either piles or some other support system so that is called uh, underpinning uh, then finally i would like to uh, discuss about the quality assurance uh, good practices actually uh, uh, it's better if this kind of practices can come from some uh, regulatory uh, body uh, but uh, <coughs> because i i have not uh, seen uh, like uh, this kind of uh, very detailed uh, quality assurance practices in the deep excavations projects in sri lanka uh, so this is like a responsibility matrix for deep excavations uh, you can see different activities uh, items and uh, the r means responsible person uh, a is the authorized person and c can this can be authorized c is the chief engineer p is the project engineer and so on the people so you can see uh, the the persons involved in the project and their responsibilities are well defined in this kind of matrix uh, the risk analysis so different types of risks during a deep excavation and uh, the risk levels has been analyzed and risk control measures have have been defined so the people who are involved in this kind of deep excavation have to be trained on uh, on the risks and the severity of the risk and the risk control measures <clears throat> so some uh, safety measures are uh, shown here i am not going to uh, go i mean to explain this in detail I, I. Uh, one important th thing is uh, we have to uh stack the uh, the uh, excavated soil away from the edge of the excavation to prevent collapse of soil and it creates lot of other issues it it creates a surcharge on the excavation site you know 1 meter of soil loose soil the weight the surcharge uh, can be about 15 to 20 uh, kilo pascals so if you have 30 let's say about 3 meter heap of soil it uh, it uh, creates a surcharge of about uh, 45 50 kilopascals so if the wall sub excavation support system is not designed to sustain such loads can have lot of problems and and if it rains it the uh, the excavated soil absorbs water and the weight goes up and and the problems can be severe uh, then uh, some safety checklists for deep, deep excavations this is a very uh, uh, a general type a general uh, uh, safety checklist uh, you know uh, how to uh, i mean see whether these are in place and uh, signature of the engineer has to be taken uh, before uh, the start of the work uh, on each day Uh, and more detailed uh, excavation checklist is sh shown here and you can see that uh, the activities are uh, categorized into say general uh, inspection of job site and there are different uh, uh, checks to be done uh, then utilities uh, if utility someone has to uh, look at the utilities whether whether they are protected supported removed and, and so on then means of access and egress uh, wet conditions hazardous atmosphere so different uh, checks to be uh, made uh, then uh, comes the support system uh, I, i if i spend some time here then uh, the materials and no equipment for support system are based on soil analysis trench depth excavated loads yes someone has to uh, check this 
uh, uh, they are in good condition and so on so a lot of checks to be done on the support system and uh, this is about uh, uh, this is an environmental checklist uh, when dewatering is taking place there it, there it can cause a lot of uh, environmental issues so this is about uh, discarding uh, the uh, the dewatering the water uh, <coughs> so some checklist is given here and I forgot to tell uh, that in recharging uh, the uh, the uh, groundwater table you have to take clean water uh, if we are using the water from the excavation it has to be clean prior to recharge to use in recharge otherwise uh, the recharge wells can clog very easily so uh, that's all uh, my presentation and thank you very much for listening thank you dr nali uh, it is a very very uh, informative uh, presentation and lot of uh, important things have been focused and uh, mentioned and it is the time for discussion i invite the participant to raise their questions and i think i'm sure dr nalim will answer those questions Yeah, or you can put it to the chat box if you want. Yeah, Dr. Nalin, like yes. he, he, as you explained, I also observe a situation in Kandy somewhere close to the uh, uh, municipal council library. Right? So when the excavation was completed or when, uh, that when the basement was completed, they wanted to remove the sheet files, but uh, because of this, uh, all structure they it was not allowed because they they observe some cracks during the initial removal of sheet filing so then removed mm -hmm. they stopped it right so finally they had to sacrifice the sheet yeah. files there right so how can we decide it at early stage uh i mean uh you mean uh to use yeah, the whether to, because it has to be posted yeah 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 but uh, the thing is if the uh, the installation depth is large uh, so and the, the subsurface consists of sandy type soils this problem can be severe so because when you take it out you can't find any cavity or anything the soil would collapse into the cavity and uh, the ground subsidence already takes place very fast but if it is in stiff clay or something, we may we may have a, a small cavity and it can be grouted or uh, it can be filled. Think of doing that. So, uh, in my opinion, if the subsurface condition is sandy and the depth yeah, is, is large, better to consider permanent uh, sheet piles. Yeah, is there any maximum distance uh, for any type of soil right, that, that we should avoid? Uh, that, I have not seen any guidelines regarding this. It's it depends on the the case. Yeah, the type of soil and the yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah case by case area. we have to consider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. something on that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, I think especially if you have uh, building in the vicinity, uh, I mean adjoining land uh, is also having I mean, uh, sandy kind of soil. I think seed pile may not be the appropriate method unless you do the. Uh, I mean, the silent kind of uh, pile driving. Yeah. But even silent kind of dry pile driving, if you try to take the sheet pile away, you might get uh, problems. And uh, even the even driving also, there can be a possibility that the sand get densified and sand uh, can settle. And I don't think if you have the building in the vicinity, uh, sheet pile will be the appropriate methodology. Uh, for sure, it uh, that is my I don't know what is uh, Dr. Nalin think about. Yeah, it? yeah, I fully agree. Yes, yes. And also, I want to raise another question to Dr. Nalin. Uh, now, most of the uh, foundation report uh, I have seen when you have the soft soil uh, at uh, shallow depth, 
they have recommended to replace with uh, Sporida Stosan. And for that, you need uh, shoring. I have seen even sometime four to five meters of uh, replacement of uh, existing soil is, has been recommended mm. uh, with shoring condition. But as you mentioned, uh, most of time our contractor, contractor or even the consultant, they allow uh, the permeable kind of uh, uh, shoring system. Uh, I mean, there are no cutoff action. And when you do that, especially you do with uh, shallow foundation, uh, you might uh, end up with a very excessive kind of settlement because sand boiling or, or loosening of the sand can take place when there is a uh, upward seepage in the excavation pit. Yeah. Unless you devote, uh, if you if you devote the pit actually, that is normally happening in most of the cases. Uh, in one way, I, I think it is also a responsibility of the geotechnical engineer when they recommend this uh, uh, replacement of soil with that kind of situation, especially when you have the adjoining buildings. Uh, I mean, the, you have to tell, uh, recommend that uh, cutoff faults are the essential part of the shoring system. Uh, I have seen a lot of uh, complaints, also damages in the existing building as well as the new building. New buildings have been settled when you do this kind of uh, uh, kind of construction. Uh, can you add anything, Dr. Udeni, Professor Udeni and Dr. Nalin, on that? Yeah, I, I totally agree. So, uh, uh, in, in um, I mean, uh, if you are doing a ground improvement using corridors to sand, in, uh, in a subsurface where the surrounding soil is also very loose sand, then there can be a lot of problems. Uh, sometimes with the groundwater fluctuation, the fine particles in the corridors also can be washed out and the improvement um, may not be effective in the long run. So, uh, and uh, uh, in, if in the uh, carrying out the ground improvement near existing structures, uh, yes, at, um, either using cylinders or some, uh, some kind of shoring is uh, essential. Otherwise, the, there can be a lot of issues. In, uh, and uh, the improvement must extend beyond the footprint of the foundation. Otherwise, uh, it, it, uh, I mean, the stress bulb would uh, penetrate into the soft soils and it can cause a lot of uh, settlement issues. And also, uh, what I have uh, uh, yeah, Mrs. Avandu mentioned another point that uh, piping can happen if it is uh, loose sandy soil if you do not consider this in the shoring design. Yes, yes. It's that is, uh, yeah, yeah, actually, that I have seen in most of cases, uh, there is no cutoff, cutoff action in the shoring system. Hmm. That is the main problem if you deal uh, the excavation on the uh, groundwater table. Yes. And uh, even the, uh, the geotechnical report doesn't address that point actually. And because of that, uh, most of uh, designers, uh, they rec I mean, they do the foundation design exactly according to the geotechnical reports, but finally end up with uh, disasters like excessive settlement and damaging of adjoining property, uh, uh, buildings, and so on. And I think uh, Dr. Nalin uh, and Udini, if you can add something on that, especially uh, when we write this geotechnical report, we have to be very careful if you are going to replace the soil under, especially under the groundwater table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that is true, uh, Mr. Saban. Actually, yeah, especially with uh, sandy type of soils uh, with uh, uh, high water table. Yes, we agree that it has to be seriously considered in the foundation design. Yeah, and can... also, also, uh, if you do this kind of excavation, uh, uh, you you are bearing capacity. What you have measured during the uh, uh, site investigation process can be reduced due to the uh, pipe, no sand boiling, no whatever you name it, because of the uplift pressure of the water. If the groundwater table is lower uh, for the construction of the foundation. That is also a very essential factor we have to consider. Any any comment? 
Udeni? Yeah, yeah, that's why yeah, we agreed, yes. yes. Yeah, and in, uh, I have seen in some cases, sometimes uh, uh, curry dust compaction is done under water and uh, some, uh, using poker, poker vibrator, and sometimes the poker is inserted, the, uh, I mean, uh, the groundwater level is so high and poker is inserted, it's very dangerous because it can cause electrocution uh, uh, below the, the barrel. Uh, so above above water level is uh, one or two meters sometimes above the uh, the the poker vibrator so that can sometimes create a lot of uh, health and safety hazards and also uh, dr nalin i want to ask you the question because uh, there are very silence from the audience uh, the recharge Recharging also a very tricky business according to my experience. Yeah. Uh, especially, I mean, uh, uh, it is very difficult to control and also you can't get the much consistency along the boundary. Yeah. It all depends on the methodology what you use. And uh, the, the, I think the solution actually uh, for that kind of situation is to have the impermeable kind of storage system rather than having uh, this uh, especially timber plank kind of thing mm. yeah you can get a lot of uh, seepage and even what to recharge also can wash away the uh, fine particle of the adjoining uh, properties yes yeah can you add something on that yes yes i mean uh, uh, dewatering uh, if the water table is uh, high uh, using timber planks is can create a lot of problems so re recharge will not be effective because uh, the fine fine loss cannot be uh, rectified no? uh, the loss is uh, it ha once it happens it, it happens so uh, we can only recharge the water but we can't recharge the sediments therefore uh, I, I i also agree with uh, mr saband we should not do uh, groundwater charging or using uh, the uh, timber planks uh, solder pile type retaining walls if the groundwater table is high and also i have seen uh, in many cases the shallow foundation i mean the uh, uh, is going to be used after the excavation especially for basement where yeah, you uh, there is no pile foundation but only the shallow foundation but if you don't have the proper cut off all kind of uh, 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 shoring system uh, your bearing capacity will become reduced uh, drastically due to the uh, seepage forces yes sir. and i think that is also the area we have to concentrate but if it is a pile foundation of course you may be safe but even I don't say it's 100% safe because even during the concrete, you must need uh, rather solid ground to mm. hold the green concrete. Uh, but this is also one of a mistake we normally do in our construction. Yeah. I think the people who write the soil reports uh, can. Uh, you more uh, emphasis on these things because otherwise uh, uh, i mean sometimes it is very difficult to change the design especially architect want to have, have certain criteria but then as engineers we have to take precautions uh, i mean that uh, especially we have to consider the temporary situation where what will happen uh, during the construction Any more questions? I mean, I just asked two questions. I mean, just to keep the question time move forward. Any more question from the audience? I think the Professor Atula also is here, I suppose. So is he was here at the beginning, I think, because of this power cut, I think he might have mm. lost the connection. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, Most saw, of... I, I, I saw somebody from Oman as well initially with his. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, he's still there, right? Any questions from uh, Middle East area? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, good evening. Good evening, good evening. Good evening. Yes. Actually, I have uh, uh, listened to the presentation. Uh, this uh, water table issue actually is normal. Uh, not coming that much. Sri Lanka is a too much this issue is there, but here almost dry. Groundwater level is already uh, really around 25 meter, 20 meter like that below. Because of that, uh, those excavations, uh, uh, groundwater is not an issue for the excavations. Anyway, thanks for the presentation. Thank you, Prasad. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? There is a chat. Uh, sir, if possible, please share the recordings of today's and previous lecture. Ah, previous one I have already shared. Okay, I will share the today's one also. Yeah, I think I, I must be very thankful to Dr. Nalin putting a lot of uh, effort and collecting a lot of uh, material for his presentation. Last time also, it was a very, very informative kind of presentation and today also it is the same i'm very glad that uh, i mean the, our resource people have put a uh, uh, lot of effort to make a quality presentation for our audience yes if we if we don't have any more questions i would like to thank everybody who has participated uh, to listen to the uh, this presentation and also, I had to uh, especially thank uh, uh, Dr. Nalini Sidla for his effort and Dr. Udeni Namagama for conducting the uh, presentation. And also, I would like to remind uh, the audience our next presentation will be end of April by Professor Samanthi Lekasiri on Hirocode geotechnical design that we normally call EC7. And after that, we may, may have the uh, uh, course, uh, one or two days course about geotechnical design according to the Euro Code 7. That is basically the limit state kind of uh, specification of uh, code of practice, uh, different from the earlier approach of service state design. Mm. Uh, with that small, uh, with that brief note, I would like to conclude. Uh, today your forum and also again thank uh, thank you uh dr nalin de silla for your excellent presentation yeah thank you dr nalin and uh, the presentation next presentation date will be 27th of april that is the wednesday the last wednesday of uh, april okay. so, uh, yeah professor tilakasiri will conduct that lecture uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, sergius for giving me this uh, opportunity Thank you, Nalin. Okay. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.